guys, CP Morty here, back with another video. Now, recently we've been making a, a laser vlog series where we went ahead and was making things with lasers, like some of the stuff up behind me. And I did get a couple questions asking me to please explain the software and how it works, what the settings are, what I use, and all that kind of stuff. So I thought today, why not do a walkthrough of the LX Cam software that I use to control the laser engraver? Now, with that being said, well, there's nothing else really to say. So let's go ahead and jump over to our laptop and start to take a look. So if we go ahead and jump over here, yes, I am running the Dell XPS 15 9550, but also to no, we do not have any laser actually hooked up. Now, 99.99% of the program will work except for one of the menus, which I'll show in just a moment, but basically I couldn't exactly fit the laser up here as well as the laptop itself. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at the main interface. So first and foremost, when you do open up the program, this is what you are presented with. Now, unfortunately, there's not a whole ton of documentation, so you kind of have to work out what all the things do itself or watch this video, one or the other. Now, the first thing that you do want to do is go down to this port setting and choose your engraver. Now, because again, as I mentioned, I don't have anything actually hooked up, it just says port. But when you do hook up a laser engraver or one of them pencil robots, uh, it will give you the option to actually select what port it is. What number is there is totally different from each computer to computer. For example, this particular model, it is port number six, but I've seen other computers with seven, 12, 10, five, two, or one. So whatever those numbers there doesn't really matter too much. So once you've gone ahead and selected up your laser, this is where we can actually have some fun. And just starting at the top of the menu here, we do have our X and Y controls. Now this little number one in the center basically means that's how many steps the little servo is going to move each time. So for example, if it's on one, it's going to move one step each time, which is really, really slow, but also too really, really accurate. So depending on what you want to do, if you want to move the head from one side to the other, you may want to add another zero for 10 steps and move it a lot bigger increments, or you could have it just as one if you're trying to line up the laser very, very specifically. Or in the case of a pencil tool, you could also do line up the pencil there. So that's what this little uh, joystick kind of guy is doing here. It's a little bit on the slow and unresponsive side, but definitely does get the job done there. Moving down, we have some of our settings that we do use when we start to laser engrave. Now again, depending on your machine will depend on these settings, but as we can see here, we just have some settings from a previous burn I did. With the speed per millimeter at 1000, basically that is where it kind of defaults to, I believe. Uh, on my particular unit, I can go from zero all the way up to about 2,500 before things start to get inaccurate. However, when it comes to accuracy and speed, you do need to work it out for your particular machine. But for me, I just have a generic eBay kind of machine, this guy right here. And for me, I can range from zero to about 2,500 before things get really, really inaccurate. So for me, I just have it on 1,000 as I was burning a fairly thicker piece of wood. I was actually burning this little guy right here on this piece of uh, 2x4. So I did need to slow it down quite a bit because the 2x4 was having a hard time actually being engraved at all. So for me, slowing it down did definitely help. And then coming under that, we also too have our spot T. So in most laser engraves, we don't actually have to worry about this value, but basically that just means how many milliseconds it's going to stay on each point if you are using the kind of dot system. But for the most part, not many people use that. And on my particular laser engraver, the dot system doesn't work. So it doesn't really matter too much there. Underneath that, we have how many times it is going to be repeating. Now, this is kind of self-explanatory. How many times it's going to run through the same process again and again? One, two, three, four, or five times. If you want to go more, unfortunately, you just have to keep manually setting it, so there's not really that much there. And if we go into full screen mode for just a moment, we do see the rest of the commands here. So this is where the actual coordinates will set to home. So for example, this is all our little X and Y axis intersects right here will be where it is. So for me, I have it on center. So for again, this little burn right here, I actually marked out the center of this piece of wood, told the program that's where the center is and lined up the laser in the center. So what that allowed it to do was go ahead and print out properly. If I wanted to align it with this little left corner right here, I would go ahead and select left bottom and that's where the laser would actually go ahead and start. For me, I do prefer the center as that gives me a little bit more control as to finding the exact center. However, there are definitely a lot of applications out there that would definitely benefit from being centered to the left bottom, left right, or left top, or right top, so on and so forth. So uh, there is definitely a benefit to doing that, but for me, I do prefer to leave it on centered as that just goes ahead and keeps things nice and on track. 
otherwise on this particular menu not too much else here jumping up the top for just a moment let's go back to the small screen because that's a little bit easier to capture we do have the picture card so that is where you go ahead and import an image to actually engrave on the uh, machine which we'll do in just a moment we also do have text card so this is where you can put in some text so for example if we type some text in here, we can actually go ahead and set things up here. Now we'll come to this screen in just a moment and what all those settings mean, but we can import text and if we hit generate, when that decides to go and select our font and all those good things, and it generates up. We do get this message, which you shouldn't really worry too much, but again, we'll, come, uh, we'll touch on that in just a moment. And then boom, we have our text right here. Moving on, we also do have load G-Code. So if you have another program that generates its own G-Code or you prefer to use something else to generate G-Code, you can simply just load that in and it all works flawlessly. I haven't had too much experience though with the G-Code. The time that I did have an experience with it, it worked pretty fine, so I'm not too upset about that. We have our start and pause buttons right here, pretty self-explanatory there. We have a preview button, so what that actually does is on a piece of wood, so for example, if we grab this guy, it'll draw an outline with the laser on the low setting around the edge of the wood. So you can make sure everything's all lined up and it's not sort of all over the place. I really do love that preview button. Unfortunately, not exactly all program programs out there rather have a uh, preview button kind of sucks right there. The preview is really nice. We have the laser on, so this just turns the laser on if you want to do some stuff here and there. And then finally, we have the weak laser setting. Now, the weak laser setting is configured in the settings tab, but it basically turns the laser onto a weak setting, so you can either focus the laser or you can go ahead and actually move it into position. As I did mention, when I measure up the center, I actually use the weak laser to find where the heck it's actually pointing at, and it works really, really great. Now, depending on your laser will depend on the settings, but our out of the box, none of these buttons work properly, so you do need to configure them. Weak settings and also to laser on and the stuff don't work, so again, make sure you configure them in the settings tab. We'll get to that in just a moment. Jumping down though, we also do have this config tab here. Now this is more for if you have hardware limitations, so for example, we can set hardware limiters. My particular laser engraver doesn't have hardware limiters, so we can't really do too much here. We can do some stuff with pulse and acceleration and that kind of stuff. Personally, if you're just getting into laser engraving, don't really touch too much on this because it's really not going to help you unless you do have specific hardware that can take advantage of it. Then moving down to settings, this is where we get some really cool stuff. So first and foremost, we do need to select our machine. The first time you use it, you will need to select whether you're using the laser engraver or the pencil drawing robot thing. If you don't select it, it kind of works, but kind of doesn't depending on what board you have and all that kind of stuff. So just make sure you select your machine. And then if you do something and accidentally load in a ROM that doesn't work, hitting this reset ROM button is the best thing ever. Unfortunately on my unit, I accidentally loaded in the wrong ROM and I couldn't do anything. The reset ROM fixed it all and I was really, really impressed. So if you're not sure what ROM's on there, just hit that button anyway, it'll reset it and it will be good to go, provided your board is supported. So jumping under that, we also do have system version now. This will, I believe, change depending if you have the laser engraver or the pencil robot. Basically, just leave it alone. It works pretty much fine there. And under here, we have some cool settings right here. So we'll start off with weak. Weak is where we have this button up here, which is our weak laser setting. For me, 70 is the lowest it will go before it just will not turn on. So depending on what model laser you have, it might be even lower or you might have to go higher. But 70 is enough to turn the laser on without actually burning the wood or leaving any marks. Not too bad there. Moving on, we also do have the on off. So this is the strength of the laser. Now, for some unknown reason, they've made it out of 1000 rather out of 10 or I guess kind of makes sense if you want more sort of um, control but for it is 450 out of 1000 is where I usually like to run my laser I can go up to 500 but for me I seem to find that especially with 2x4 kind of wood that you can get from a local hardware store it seems to catch it on fire just a little bit so if you do have it cranked all the way to a thousand, expect burns to be a little bit all over the place. You might get some really good stuff. You may also do get some pretty terrible stuff. For me, I found 450 to 500 to be that really sweet spot if you have a two and a half watt laser. Again, for me, I have a two and a half watt laser, so 450 to 500 seems to work really well with anywhere from 1,000 to two and a half thousand uh, millimeter per second moving speed in terms of the menu we checked out before. Other than that, we just have some of these stuff that doesn't really apply to us here in the laser engraving, or especially if you have a base entry level one so there's nothing really too much to worry here we got 3d view and that kind of stuff which is eh, we can toggle it on or off doesn't really make too much a difference to what we're doing and basically that's all we really need to worry about here just your on off kind of uh, strength and also to your weak strength is something you do need to set because out of the box 
doesn't work at all. Then moving on to gallery, as we just take a look right here, it basically just comes with a bunch of pre-built images, logos and stuff that I'm sure the copyright holders would not be thrilled to see in this program, but it comes with some basic stuff to allow you to do some basic testing. So from my test, all of these stuffs work perfectly fine with a lot of different settings out there. So if you want to just grab an image that is guaranteed to work, grab one of these guys out, chuck it on your plane and you should be good to go. So they're really not the most greatest images and again the copyright holders probably wouldn't be that thrilled but it is a really simple process just to get some basic stuff onto your plane and just basically roll from there if you don't want to go around the internet trying to find uh, images and stuff that would actually work. So for example if we wanted to engrave an image let's go ahead and take a look at this little pop-up screen. So whether you're importing an image or anything like that, this is the picture card menu that will come up. And take a look around here, there's actually a lot of really nice control. So first and foremost, we do get this slider up the top. This just changed how um, contrasty the actual image is. So if you want to burn an actual image or a logo or something that might have variations of black, basically what you can do here is crank this guy up and it will just basically turn everything that's gray or black into complete black or vice versa. So it is really helpful to have, but on an image like this where it is already black, there isn't too much of a worry here. Moving down to this uh, little side right here, we do get some buttons. For example, we can turn that image around, we can flip it, invert it, and all that kind of stuff. Really, really helpful if you've got different settings and different images that don't exactly work properly. For me, I've never really had to use them because I seem to just import them properly. And also too, we have this little sushi icon thing uh, that basically turns it from black and white into white on black. So for example, if you have an image that is white, you can flip it into black and so on and so forth. Whatever is black will be burnt into the wood. So for example, uh, in the actual um, image here for this little MSI crate snake, basically everything that is black is well gone ahead and colored in. So for example, in this image right here, everything that's black will be burnt in and then this little white section will be left and vice versa. So if we go ahead and just flip that out, if it decides to work, either way, it doesn't really matter. Over here, we do have our ratios and size of the image. Now, from my understanding, this is actually in millimeters. So we have 80 millimeters wide by 110 millimeters tall. Obviously, this is locked in a ratio depending on your image. So if we put in two, yes, we know that there's an error. Uh, so if we put in 200 right here, we do see that it has gone, or oh, well, 100, we got 100 wide by 138 tall. Now, if you're unsure of how big to actually make it, type in a value, hit that preview button, that I mentioned before, it all works perfectly fine. So once you do find your size, we do also too need to select how we're going to be printing it. So we do have our speed here. For me, speed doesn't matter too much in this window because I do some test prints before I actually do my final one and adjust it in another menu, which we'll show you in just a moment. But we do have the option to do a real print, a scan, an outline, or a point. So point is, as I mentioned before, firing the laser in little dots, just like a dot matrix printer back in the day. We have scan, which basically just goes on the uh, X and Y axis all the way down the page. Really Really, really slow. I've never used it because it's just too slow to actually get anything done. We have outline, which does exactly what it says, an outline of the image. Do I have anything outlined? Not really behind me, but it is an outline of the image. And then we have real point. So basically, this is what I use for just about 99% of everything I do. Works just about flawlessly. And under here, we have how many lines or how detailed the resolution actually is. Now, it only goes up to 20, but if you key in, for example, 100, or if I actually key in the right digits there, uh, it will actually work. So you can key in more. However, with that being said, depending on your laser, depending on the strength and settings, you may find yourself just catching the wood on fire because it is too detailed. For example, in about a 100 by 100 kind of image, I do find myself running anywhere from 1000 to 2500, as I did mention before. But when it comes to actually lines per millimeter, I do find myself running around that 15 line marker. Again, depending on the size, depending on the scale and that kind of stuff will depend on what it is. It is a bit of trial and error. And then finally, I do fold line. Line by line kind of works fine, but I've seen a lot more success when running fold line. So I generally do that. We hit generate, it gives us a little message as I did mention before, this is nothing to really worry about. It's just one of those weird software things that it just does that and boom, it throws it up on the screen. So. At this point, what we can do is go back to control, line up our device, we can set the home. So for example, if you've moved uh, the X and Y axis, it doesn't want to do that. But if you move the X and Y axis, what it will do when you push start is go back to where it was, which is not what you want to do. So make sure you line everything up correctly, you set the home, and then you can go ahead and actually get started. One final thing that I do also to want to mention before you do go ahead and actually get engraving is there's also to the option to change the speed while you're going. So for example, if you start engraving and you're finding 1000 is just getting that little bit too dark, 
dark, hit that pause button right up here, and then change that speed to say 1500 or 2000, so on the fly you can actually change the speed. So again, if you're not finding it's burning properly, you can either speed it up or decrease that speed, but a bit of trial and error is definitely needed. And then finally, I guess there's also to this little menu that we haven't touched on, mainly because it doesn't apply to us at all one bit. This is just different views because this program is technically speaking designed for 3D applications as well, and because we're only burning 2D images for us, well, doesn't really make much of a difference. So if we were working in 3D space, it would make a difference, but uh, that's what it is. So unfortunately you can't drag because when you drag, it goes into this 3D view and freaks out and you just click that button to go back. So you do zoom in and out. So what I'm doing is just scrolling up and down on my trackpad to zoom in and out. Unfortunately, you cannot drag yourself around. You just end up in these little extra views, which ah, doesn't really matter too much because once you hit go, it will start printing off and you will be good to go. Otherwise, that's about it for the Alex Evolution desktop cam software. As for grabbing it online, I would go ahead and try and actually leave some links down in that description box. Unfortunately, when I was looking for it, I found it really, really hard. In fact, I found a physical disk copy before I actually got a download copy. I'm sure someone out there is going to now message me saying, I found a download copy in two minutes. Well, you know what? Good for you. Anyway, uh, in terms of the rest of the software, that's about it for us using lasers. It's a really simple process and after playing around with it for about an hour, you should pick it up no problems. Otherwise, that's about it for this quick little walkthrough of the Alex Maker Cam software stuff thing version 3.1. Uh, all the links to the actual software will be linked down in the description box. Otherwise, if you're interested in lasers or you have any questions about the software, let me know down in that comment section. I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks all for watching and I'll catch you all in the next one. Wow.